going back to your comments about the um, media and the, the great public relations that employ and, and right. But See, I think all that stuff is totally illegitimate. I mean, and that goes way back to something much earlier. Why should corporations have any rights at all? Okay, okay. I mean, that's not like it's not in the Constitution. You know, Con uh, corporate rights are the result. Of, it's not even by legislation. I mean, corporate rights were achieved mostly through courts and lawyers, and pretty recently. You know, the main decisions are early in this century. Like, it's not found in you know, it's not graven in stone or anything like that. Actually, there's pretty good literature on this. If you're interested, the best book is by a Harvard professor uh, that I know, a guy named Morton Horowitz, who's at the law school, has a couple of books called Transformation of American Law. One of them, I think, goes up till well, like 1860, and the other from maybe 1860 to 1960. But the main theme of the book, of the two, these two big volumes, um, is, is interesting reading. You know, it sounds kind of dense and so on, but it's, you find it interesting reading. The main theme is how the legal system was reshaped to accommodate to the needs of private power. Okay, all the way through, that's been the main theme of the legal system: how to modify it so that illegitimate, tyrannical authority is given more and more power, undermining democratic principles. That's basically, he didn't say it in those words, but that's what it comes down to. And the big step, you know, the major step probably was the transfer of uh, rights to private tyrannies, which is what corporations are, early in this century. And as he points out, he doesn't go into it much, this, he really, but I think he's right, uh, this developed out of ideas kind of Hegelian ideas about the rights of organic entities over individuals, which are also at the roots of Bolshevism and fascism. And I should mention that that comparison is, may sound exotic now, but it wasn't a long, you know, 60 years ago. You read, say, mainstream American political economists like Robert Brady, important political economist, it's kind of Veblenite, <coughs> back around the 19, uh, early 1940s, I guess. Uh, he wrote books about you know, big business as a system of power, things like that, in which he points out, yeah, these things are basically totalitarian in structure, you know, which they are. Uh, so where'd they get their rights? Well, through courts and lawyers, uh, by playing one state against one another. Incidentally, that's something worth thinking about when you listen to this devolution business now. The point of getting power down to the states is so that any business, even a middle-sized business, can make sure that the money goes into their pockets, not in the pockets of poor people. It's trickier to do it at the federal level. So that's why you get all this new philosophy about you know, federalism and so on. Not that federalism would be bad, but you know, not when you've got private tyrannies around. This establishment of private, cor of private corporate power is a dramatic example of that. Uh, back, I forget exactly what year, but like early in this century, maybe around 1905 or something, uh, the state of New Jersey figured it could make a killing by getting the big corporations to move from New York, where they always were, over to New Jersey, simply by giving them a lot of gifts. You know, it's kind of like when Alabama gets uh, investment from Germany, you sort of the taxpayers pay for it, but you know, somebody makes a killing. Uh, that's, uh, uh, and that's exactly what they did. So New Jersey gave corporations all sorts of you know, gifts, essentially, to move across the river. And that's why you have so many things called, you know, Standard Oil of New Jersey and that sort of thing. Yeah, because they moved across the rivers, so they could be incorporated there. Uh, at, uh, and it's a lot cheaper for the big power because the taxpayers of New Jersey paid them. Uh, Delaware was another case. Uh, well, of course, New York had to accommodate, you know, because everybody's moving across the river. That's the new federalism back at the early part of this century. Uh, so that's the, and, and by such a mechanism, uh, public funds did end up in pri big, deep private pockets, and corporations gradually got rights that they, you know, that are, in my opinion, totally illegitimate. Uh, those rights can be taken away very simply uh, without a revolution. In fact, every corporation has a state charter, I mean, and they're supposed to be there for some public good, you know. Well, like it's, it was true maybe 200 years ago. Like 200 years ago, we could like establish a corporation that would like build a bridge across the Charles River or something. Okay, that's what a corporation was supposed to be. It's changed a bit over the years. 
Uh, by now, they are huge tyrannies, I mean, bigger than states, involved in all kind of strategic interactions with one another in violation of uh, any conceivable prince market principle and so on and so forth. Well, there's no reason why they should exist, I don't think. And the media is just part of it. It's, it's particularly harmful to democracy when media systems are in the hands of private tyrannies. I mean, it's bad enough if the guys who, you know, sh sh making shoes is or cars, that's bad enough. But when it's control over the doctrinal system and information, that's much worse. Uh, that's why I think the stuff that's going on in telecommunications now is so, should really have a lot more attention than it does. I mean, here's this huge system, you know, built at public expense. I mean, you guys paid for it, you know. Uh, and as usual, being handed over to private power now that it's profitable. And it's very likely, I think, most media analysts with their heads screwed on see and indeed even report that it's going to end up in the hands of a half a dozen mega corporations internationally. Well, that's worse than the oligopolies that run steel and computers, because here we're talking about a new mode of information and communication and so on, as always built at public expense. And right now, right in the middle of it, being handed over to private power, incidentally not being reported. I mean, like, it's not that there's no reporting, like you've heard about the Telecommunications Act, but it wasn't discussed as a public interest issue. It was discussed as a business issue. And in fact, most of the reporting was in the business pages. This is the big legislative achievement of last Congress, you know, Telecommunications Act of 1996. Uh, reported in the business pages, and not as a public interest issue. Like, it's not supposed to be a question of public interest, whether major systems of information and interchange are handed over as gifts to Rupert Murdoch. That's not supposed to be an issue of public interest. The only thing that was discussed was, like, do you give it to six corporations or 12, you know, or do you do it this way or that way? Well, you know, that's uh, effective indoctrination when these, ideas, when these things don't even occur to people takes real indoctrination. But yeah, I think you're right. These are, this is worse than the handing over of decision-making power to private tyrannies, because in this case, it's also handing over you know, access to the things that they're going to use for control of the public mind. These systems could also be used to liberate people. Comment on uh, educational uh, systems, uh, K-12, and uh, the president has just adopted a uh, bunch of good stuff, but uh, there's still a lot of problems there. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how good the good stuff is. I'd, ra I'd like to, s I mean, I haven't, s the details haven't come out yet. But from the reporting that I've heard, and, you know, I've read maybe, you know, more, uh, the actual proposals that are going to come along are going to be granting benefits of one kind or another to people of income levels, kind of like mine, you know, people up to the level of like, you know, eighty, hundred thousand dollars a year. Well, you know what, the, I forget the last figures, but I think the median income in the United States is something like around 30 some. Now the idea of giving rich people special benefits so their kids can go to school, well, okay, uh, who's paying? You know, well, the poor people are paying. So I'm not so sure it's such great stuff when you look at it. Uh, same with other things. You know, the big investment firms, Lehman Brothers in this case, are now circulating brochures. Those of you who are wealthy enough must be receiving these things, you know. They're re distributing brochures to their, you know, rich customers, uh, telling them, look, we've taken over the health system, we've taken over the the criminal system, you know, we're right now taking over the welfare system, we're enriching, here's a new way to enrich ourselves at public expense. They don't, not their words, you know, this is my translation. Uh, the way we will do it is by setting up EMOs, okay, educational management organizations, which will do wonders for the educational system like HMOs do for healthcare, about the same, in fact. Uh, namely, they will be able to take more and more money away from the system and put it in private, you know, private power. Uh, meanwhile, reduce uh, shaping care so that it mostly benefits the rich and harms everybody else. 
and now we can do it for the educational system, the last big government monopoly. I mean, this, it's not put this way. It's all put in terms of efficiency and what nice people we are, and we're going to make everything so better, much better for everyone, like because we're just benefactors and so on. But uh, go through it, and that's what it is. Yeah, I think those are probably the new plans that will be coming along. Uh, and I would be very cautious about the Clinton's proposals. Look at them really carefully. See to what extent they're lending themselves. To, after all, remember he is—he is not—he has made no secrets about what he is. I mean, he is and always has been a moderate Republican, candidate of the business community. He's—he's he's never pretended to be anything else. You know, never. never pretended to be anything else. He's a business candidate. He his his main. Uh, influence on the Democratic Party was to move it over to the Republican side with the Democratic Leadership Council. He never, it's, it's not like a secret or anything. He said it, you know, he made it very clear. Uh, his record in Arkansas was like that. His influence in the national government was like that. So whatever the Democratic Party may have been, which you can sort of debate, uh, it's now, like, if you can find a difference between Cl Dole and Clinton, I'd like to know what it was, you know. I mean, a, a policy difference. They're both moderate Republicans. Incidentally, the business press is very well aware of this. I mean, take, take a look at the Wall Street Journal editorials the first couple of years, uh, you know, or, or reporting the first, you know, throughout the whole Clinton years. I mean, at first they were a little nervous because he had some of this populist rhetoric. But pretty soon, within a few months, you start getting, you know, editorials in the Wall Street Journal and articles, in fact, not just editorials about how Clinton is the best president uh, business has ever had. You know, they quote the Ford Company executive as saying, we're getting along with them much better than we did with Bush and Reagan, uh, and on and on. Now, of course, you know, they'd prefer the Gingrich guys, actually with some ambiguity, I should say, because they don't like the small business aspect of the Gingrich people. There's a delicate balance there between holding off the crazies and making sure that the really rich people get everything. Uh, so there's been a problem. But uh, uh, the, as far as Clinton was concerned, they were perfectly happy with him. Yeah, he's a moderate Republican. Uh, so, and I don't, think, I don't think you can say that he's deceived anyone. You know, if you look at his positions all the way along, they've been very clear. If people didn't want to see it, that's their choice. But uh, it's been clear. It's been clear to the business press. It's been clear in his policies. Exactly what kind of education program would be crafted out of that, I'd be very suspicious about it. And I think it's worth a very careful look. I mean, there's plenty of problems with the educational system, but the main problem is that uh, way too few resources go into it. Now, it's not that we don't have money. You know, like there's no budget crisis or anything like that. The country's just flooded with money. Again, read the business press. You know, it cannot find adjectives exuberant enough to describe, you know, the dazzling, stupendous profit growth and you know, what are we going to do with all those funds and so on. The country's just flooded with money, capital, but all getting very narrowly concentrated. Okay? There's plenty of money around to improve the educational system, and we know exactly where it has to come from. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I think that's its main problem. I mean, teachers are way underpaid. You know? uh, they're undereducated. They're not given enough respect. Too many kids in school, in a classroom, you know, not enough uh, uh, educational materials and so on and so forth. Uh, now, there's no special, you know, nobody has any brilliant ideas about, at least I've never heard any, about how people should be educated except, you know, kids' natural enthusiasm and creativity ought to be allowed to, you know, harness, work in constructive way. I mean, all this kind of stuff. You know. what, what's missing is the resources. Fine, so let's provide the resources. So maybe they won't have such dazzling and stupendous profits next year and instead kids will get a better education. I think that's what ought to happen. The, but what I'm worried about is it's going that the system is moving towards the kind of privatization which just imposes costs on the public. 